Well, I'm, I'm reluctant to interrupt that happy noise, but <laughs> for a happier one. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming and, and taking an hour out of the summer. Um, it'll be well worth it. I'm Elizabeth Foy. I'm head of St. Paul's Forum. I know lots of people here, um, but there are a few happy new faces as well. And this is ba Bishop Simon Barrington Ward, who's written this lovely book about the Jesus Prayer. Um, and, but more to the point, I think, is one of the great advocates and teachers of the Jesus Prayer. And one of the great joys of my job here running this programme is that I'm allowed to ask the people that I like most <laughs> and, and have benefited from, and among many people, uh, I am somebody who's benefited greatly from Bishop Simon's wisdom and kindness. So if you'd welcome him. Thank you. What a very kind, warm introduction. I'm quite overwhelmed by that. Um, I, do, I don't know if I'm a great teacher or inspirer, but I do what, like to encourage people to learn to pray this prayer because I found it such a help myself. And uh, that's really how it all began for me. I had, I'm ashamed to say, considerable difficulty with prayer, personal prayer, not with leading prayer or worship and the other kinds of things that we get up to. But um, my own personal times of meditation and quiet, I, I hadn't found the right way somehow at theological college or after that at, at Cambridge or when I was involved in the Church Mission Society quite. In fact, it was when I was General Secretary, I'm ashamed to confess, of the Church Mission Society that I can dared to speak to somebody there close to me and tell him about this difficulty that I had in really getting going in a kind of meditative or quiet prayer. And somehow I felt that there was a gap in, in my life, even when I was training people to go as missionaries and training them to pray, which I could do, uh, I still felt that I hadn't found the way for me. And he said, I'll take you somewhere where you can find that. And he seemed very confident. He's a lovely man, Paul Hunt is his name. And uh, I was very happy to go with him. So he appointed a time. He said it was going to be a mystery tour. And it was, we drove from our headquarters in Waterloo Road and he rather lost his way actually <laughs> in Essex, the wilds, wilds of Essex. But eventually, he found it again, went through a little village which was called Tollish Hunt Nights, not all that far from the, the jam making. Um, get, get the name of it this moment, but you know where I mean. Tip tree. That's right, Tip Tree. Uh, and as, I were, as we were going along there, I realized that the church that we saw in the distance, or that he pointed out to me, was no longer the church of the town. And indeed, that it seemed that the vicarage too had moved, had been left behind, as it were, and it had been taken over by a community. And so that's what we were going to. And this community was an offshoot, in some ways, of the uh, Russian Orthodox, a, an Russian, a Russian Orthodox congregation in London, and the Russian congregations, Orthodox congregations everywhere, found the same thing in Greece, in, in Egypt, um, like to have a monastery. It, it, it's more important to, to many of them than a bishop, is to have a monastery, and they link with it. And this is what happened here, um, in this monastery apparently, parish, and I've seen for myself now, comes down every weekend practically and sometimes lots of children and the monks and nuns, they're both in one community, which is quite exceptional and interesting, look after the children brilliantly and look after the people brilliantly and inspire them. And it's a very remarkable place and it's called the uh, the, the place is, is called the um, Community of St. John the Baptist. 
in Atoli near Atolishant Nights. As we arrived, we were late, of course, because of what had happened. A little group of nuns and monks were waiting for us in their white habit, and Paul had told me what I should say when they said, Christ is amongst us, which they would say to me, I was to reply, he is and ever shall be. And I found that they say that to each other quite a bit. It's a sort of password through the community somehow. Christ is amongst us. He is and ever shall be. And it was lovely having that little exchange and feeling that very much meant on both sides. And they took me off into the evening service. Of course, I was expecting an evening monastic office. But actually on that night, certainly, and on many nights, the Igumen, the abbot of the monastery, whose name was Archimandrite Sophroni, uh, hadn't, didn't have that at all. He, he, he'd introduced a different order, which I think is unique, even orthodox, in orthodox monasteries, from what I've observed. But I didn't know that then. I was even given a chair to sit in it, everyone else was standing. And, uh, and Paul and I were given chairs and uh, near the back and a voice suddenly said Lord Jesus Christ Son of God have mercy upon us Lord Jesus Christ Son of God have mercy upon us it was a woman's voice in that particular moment but it could have been a man it could have been anyone in that congregation and indeed, it soon was somebody else. They go, went on for a time. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon us. And everybody standing round us was intent on the prayer. And it was quite remarkable how it gripped one. I've since discovered in their Eucharistic worship the same feeling of a kind of reaching out to the goal a reaching out to the end, a reaching out to the climax, a reaching out to the new creation and the risen presence of the risen and exalted Christ in the midst. It was quite remarkable how strongly that one, that sense captured one just through being in this group completely concentrated on this, this movement of the spirit as indeed it was. And after it had happened for some time, I was really quite gripped into it. I have to confess that even so, I did fall asleep a little bit way through. It was about two hours, the service. And um, I woke up again, it didn't seem to matter. The prayer was going on and still carrying me and all around me were people standing intent. In fact, it felt very much like, apart from that disgraceful episode, it felt very much like um, being in a flock of birds might be uh, migrating, as it were, a whole movement with everyone praying together round this prayer with one person leading it. It was quite striking and moving. And by the end of it, I suddenly realised I'd been caught up into it completely and that it had something of the, must have a key to the answer to my own problem. It seemed so exciting and, and different from anything I'd known. And I asked if I could speak to Father Sophroni, if I could go and meet with him. And th there was a little uncertainty whether that would be possible. And in any case, it was a bit premature to start asking to go and see him so soon and so on. But this was brushed aside. Father Sophroni said he would be delighted to see you. And I went through to meet with him and I said to him as soon as I could, he had a very nice shrewd twinkle in his eye and looked at one and there were icons of all seeming to gaze, they never quite gaze at you do they, but gaze through you or past you above him. And I was very struck by um, the way he looked at me and I said, do you think I could ask you to teach me? To pray this prayer, I realised that it must need to be taught. It does need to be taught, he said, but I'm not prepared to teach you unless you're prepared to come back regularly 
every three weeks to start with, and then longer, uh, and learn. I said, I am prepared. I was so sure that this was going to be a way for me and through somehow. And so he said he would teach me. And indeed, he began to teach me straight away because he handed me a prayer rope, which is not essential, let me hasten to add to the prayer. It's an adjunct, which quite a few people have. And I noticed that all the monks usually who pray the prayer have them and nuns. Um, it's a knotted, as you can perhaps see, a knotted wool cord and with wooden beads at intervals. And he explained to me straight away his first lesson, if you like. This, he said whimsically, of the ta tassel is my Pentecost. And he stroked it and said, and I pray taking this Pentecost tassel, this symbol in my hand at the beginning. And then he said, I pray, O oh God, the Holy Spirit, draw me, and the, just above the, the tassel is a cross in wool. And he laid his finger and thumb on it. Draw me through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, into your triune love, and he put his finger and thumb on three knots above it, which are held together, into your triune love, O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then he said he moved to the first bead, which was just there, and began the prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. That's what he told me I was to say on my own. I jibbed a little bit at this when it, we had a pause after a, a pr praying it, his praying it for some time and getting me to join in it with him. About the sinner, I said, ought we to be keep rubbing into ourselves that we are sinners? And he immediately replied, so you're not a sinner. <laughs> Uh, well, no, no, I can't say that, and so on. And he said, acknowledge what we are, because what we learn as we invoke the presence, which is the way he put it, of the Lord Jesus Christ, is that he is always, as we enter into his presence, love and forgiveness. His forgiveness is flowing as we pray. And as you acknowledge this, so he is, his love is flowing out to cleanse you. It's a forgiveness and a mercy that are going to grasp you. And I was very deeply struck by that, in fact. And then, as, as, as we had prayed in that kind of way, and as I'd grown into this, he told me to go off and use it. And I, I found in his talk of the practice of the presence, one other thing came back to me. When I was a much younger boy, a great friend of the family whom I used to go and stay with, whose house was a kind of holy place without my knowing it. It was somewhere one, where one could feel the love of God, in the sort of way I was feeling it then with him. And she always encouraged me. And she gave me a little book, which most people here will know probably, but I just mention it, the Practice of the Presence of God by Brother Lawrence. He was a monk who had written about, in simple letters, about the way in which he saw a tree in the winter, bleak and dark with nothing, and knew that in the summer, because he'd seen it before, that in the summer it would be flowering abundantly and full of fruit. And he said that this suggested to him immediately that he should live for that and be in the presence of God, living for his fruit to f and his flowers to come as one kept the presence. This seemed a, a wonderful grand idea when I was a teenage boy and I went back and tried to do it at school. 
The only trouble was, I found, that after about a few minutes, you'd got diverted into something else, even if you were on your own. And I could never keep this presence. Uh, it was a little bit too vague and ethereal somehow. And although I loved reading Brother Lawrence's book, and I certainly commend it, The Practice of the Presence of God, it's easier said than done. And I found that that came back to me because Father uh, uh, Sophroni so emphasized uh, the practice of the presence of Christ in the prayer. But this time he'd given me something to do, words to speak, which I could repeat. And although your mind wanders, as he told me it would, to other things, you keep coming back to it and it keeps drawing you in. And then he said to me, when he put his fingers on the wooden beads from time to time in the rope, he would just be, go still and be up still in the presence. And as soon as the presence began to go, or began to give way to something else, he started up again on the prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me, a sinner. And he said that after a time, you'll find the prayer will continue constantly in your mind at all sorts of stages and moments until it becomes almost something that goes on the whole time. You'll wake at night and pray. It. And the prayer will not be the prayer or saying the prayer, it will be the presence and love and forgiveness of God in Christ. It's a practice of the presence of Christ. So I found that very um, helpful and strengthening and I went away and it found to my great joy that it really worked even for me and that I'd really found a way of seeking to and even beginning to find I could live in the presence of Christ for quite long periods because of his gracious will to, to be with us in this way. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. And another thing that taught me very much was John 15, especially dwell in me and I in you. Apart from me, you can do nothing. That's fairly convicting. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So somehow the presence, knowing the presence and using the prayer often can help. I started certainly only by using it uh, at some of the time or stretches of time. And I think lots of people whom I try to help find that that's as far as they get. And I'm sure that that helps them a very great deal. Uh, but gradually I have found that the prayer prays itself in you, in your consciousness, more and more. And I find it just staying quietly with one. Not as a chore or a duty or something you must keep going, even though you really, really would like to stop. I don't mean anything like that at all. I mean something that just quite naturally keeps coming and you keep sensing the presence. And that's why I find the prayer so enormously helpful, deeply helpful. But I do try to encourage people who don't necessarily get to that kind of feeling about it to use the prayer as and when they can. So that was an enormously important start for me and very helpful indeed. And as I began to think about it more, I thought of times or people who had mentioned this before. I remembered a, a lady who came to Cambridge and gave a most, I think one of the most beautiful women I've ever seen in her 60s actually by then, I think, late 50s anyway. Her husband, Julia de Beausobre was her name. Her husband had been um, a, a Russian with a French sounding name, which in the Russian aristocracy of his time wasn't so uh, uh, infrequent and he was called de Beausob and he and she were in the Russian embassy in London uh, at the time of the Re Russian revolution in 1917 and fairly soon afterwards he began to feel 
that they should go back to help the new government. That was his whole attitude. So very bravely, she wanted him not to. They went back together to Moscow and for a time he was given various jobs, but after a bit they began to be suspicious of him and rumours began to spread that he had been up to some plot or something, which of course he hadn't. He was a very genuine man indeed. And as a result he was arrested and she used to have to go to the prison taking bundles of shirts and clothes. And it was a, a very painful task and she was so anxious about him, she never saw him again. In fact, uh, she heard afterwards that he had been shot. And she, um, completely on a, a false charge, a and she herself, as she was bent over the uh, clothes one day, a bundle she was making, felt a great blow in her back, she said, like a, almost something pushing her down. She described it. And she said that having heard that, she realised that uh, God was saying something to her and telling her, peace will be to the left of you, peace to the right of you. Wherever you go, I will be with you. And it was at that moment almost, very, very soon after, they arrived to arrest her as well. And she was taken off to the, Lub to the Lubyanka, the central prison in Moscow, the same place where he had been. She was with several women in a cell where they had bare light bulbs all night as well as all day. And she kept being taken out to be interrogated. And they were very suspicious, you see, of, of this couple having come back, I suppose. And she found that th they were quite painful in the way they twisted her arm and so on. But actually, after a bit, she was given the answers all the time, somehow, she felt. She felt at peace as she stepped into the corridor, the long corridor, and felt all the kind of yearning hearts all around her in these little cells. How many thousands of prisoners have been who've suffered or gone on like that in Russia over the, over the years? Anyway, she was eventually bundled into a lorry and sent off to a camp. And it was when she was in that camp that there was a group of nuns, who, one of, two of whom were sick and the others looking after them. And as she helped with the nursing, she'd been given some nursing to do by the prison authorities, which she had some background in. And they, they, they said to, to, to her, keep praying. You must pray this prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy upon me. And they taught her the prayer. They said, as you came, it will make, it will clear a place of freedom and peace around you in the camp and it will strengthen you. And I, I do believe now from all the stories that I've heard when I went to Russia that um, hundreds of people have prayed that prayer, perhaps thousands of them, and been strengthened and helped and led through their difficult times. So it's a prayer that has brought people presence and peace in all, all, all those times. I think that's a rather wonderful thing, fact. So the next um, thing that I wanted to tell you, have I got time, have I? Absolutely. Uh, that is that I, the prayer has grown for me tremendously and I've met people, other people praying it and I dared to write that book, um, which I felt was a bit presumptuous of me, but the monastery blessed it. By that time, Father Sophroni had gone through, as I might put it, because he was one of these people who became more and more translucent and then seemed to just sort of have gone through the curtain. Uh, he died, but uh, the monastery has very much gone on from strength to strength. The whole idea of having men and women in one community was his, and he had a, there was a woman as a deputy to him working as well. And the nuns are wonderful. The marvellous Sister Maria, who's a great icon maker. And she draws all the children into helping her with some of the icons. There's a wonderful one of a ladder going up to the door of the ark and all the animals coming out um, down back into the 
earth, as it were, uh, which she did. And she's done all kinds of beautiful icons. They're very creative. Father Sofreni was a painter, an artist originally, who was reconverted in Paris when he was back trying to sell his paintings there, having fled the communist revolution. And he, it was through that that he had this sense of God's love holding him. And that is particularly when the prayer began to mean more to him, but it was essentially that he went off to Mount Athos. And the person who really taught him the prayer was a fellow member of a Russian monastery called Saint Pantelemon. And he formed very strong bonds with the monasteries in Mount Athos. And in Saint Pantelemon, uh, this uh, monk, whom he got to know so well, um, beca became his teacher, really. He wrote a book about him called A Monk of Mount Athos. It's still being printed by the, the um, uh, community in Tolishant Night. And so it's a lovely book. This was a man called Saint, as he became, th partly through, I think, uh, Sophroni's book, Saint Siloan, S-I-L-O-U-A-N. And I can't forbear to rapidly tell you because it's not directly on the Jesus Prayer, but he did teach him the Jesus Prayer more than anyone, but directly to tell you that, quickly to tell you that for a time, Siloan had the same kind of exact sensation that I'd had in miniature. That is that he had had a great sense of God's love and presence, as I had, but it was all taken from him and he was left completely blank and he struggled and struggled and the blankness, I was so touched to hear this. I told Father Sofreni my experience and he shared this and it's in his book about him. He, he eventually was desperate one night and said, is that nothing can help me against all the demonic thoughts and demons that are assailing me all round and I've got nothing to answer. And the voice of God said to him gently and piercingly, seems an incredibly severe thing for God to say to him, keep thy mind in hell and despair not. But he took it as a com command to be at peace because something would happen. All day long he was working with people who had come from Russia to help the monastery. and He was looking after the workers and at night he came back and prayed his own offices and took part in the community as well. So he gave a great deal and sure enough, gradually, the moment came when the prayer began to be, bring the presence and he began to find God in a deep, rich way as he'd never known before. And in fact, he, he, he grew into a, a very remarkable uh, holy person, as it were. And Sophroni was with him when he died and came back to Paris after the war, partly to his old haunts, partly where he, so that he could write the book, A Monk on Mount Athos, about him. He was so impressed. He formed lifelong links, of course, between Essex and Mount Athos, as I discovered. And I better just go to, through to this last part quickly. But just recently, uh, I wanted to go um, and see Mount Athos for myself. I went with a friend and, uh, from, uh, who had been a chaplain at Magdalen College, as I had, and both of us went together. Um, and we had a wonderful time there this last fortnight. I've only just got back. Uh, and we went to six monasteries, which were suggested to us by a holy professor who came and gave a lecture in Cambridge uh, about the Jesus Prayer, and I went to it, and he was very kind to both of us. He, I introduced Philip to him uh, when he came up to Cambridge. I got him in touch with him, and he recommended us six monasteries to go to, and he put down somebody in each, and he wrote to them all. He teaches in the, at Thessaloniki in the Theological University, this professor. And it's so kind of him to do this, it made all the difference. So in that short time, we went from monastery to monastery, spending two nights at each and three at one. 
and it was a marvellous time. Now in each monastery he had given us one person to talk to about the Jesus prayer and uh, particularly and we had people with lovely names like Father Theophilus, lover of God, in the first, second monastery I think we went to, who was so helpful. Father Matthew was in the first one and then the second, that was huge the first one there and rather crowded with masses and masses of students and so on who were all tramping around Athos on holiday. Uh, had to be male of course. Uh, and um, it, though, um, well, I'll tell you in a moment, uh, so that we did have that time to talk with him, Father Matthew, but then Father um, Theophilus told us, I said to him, what would you say about the Jesus prayer? He looked at me gently and said, the Jesus prayer is love. It is just love flowing and throwing through you. Very much something of what uh, uh, Father Sophroni had said, but there was this difference that in the way they spoke about it, it seemed like being infilled with the Spirit some, in some Pentecostal uh, talk and in the way in which people talk about being filled with the Spirit. But as you prayed the prayer, praying of course, come Holy Spirit, uh, that the prayer prayed into you and through you and became a kind of rhythm in you as you went on. And I recognised that as being true. But obviously they teach that more. And it's, it's very obvious that in the community where you're all praying the prayer, it's much easier for that sense to grow. And you could f sense that. And then Father Chrysostom said something very similar to us in the next monastery. He spoke about this. We also had a Father Palamas, Gregory Palamas, the great Archbishop of Thessaloniki in a very troubled period when he was assailed by a kind of humanist, um, neo-Platonist, just neo-Platonism, I mean a very vague mysticism, uh, who had been influenced by the early Renaissance in Italy and had the kind of rationalism and the kind of negativity that quite a lot of people have in our own community. And also some of the very strange theology that is around as well and he um, came and ass assaulted the monks of Mount Athos where Archbishop P uh, Palamas w w was living at the time and, and training. He, uh, he became the Archbishop during that time. And he wrote a marvellous book called The Triads, um, attacking this and trying to show that only in Christ would we have the true union of God and humanity. We mustn't lose touch with that above all very much the lessons of other patrist great patristic writers like Makarios, an earlier writer, who's got a marvellous passage on that. He was one of the people after Chalcedon, arguing that the human and divine nature held together in, in us as in no, nowhere other way through Christ. That Christ is our bond with God in a very special way. And therefore that all the Neoplatonists and things all have something but they need this. It's not a matter of writing them off. It's a matter of drawing them in or drawing them on. It's a matter of recognizing, of course, the presence and love of God in all kinds of people, faiths and attitudes, but holding to this deep, rich sense, which the Jesus prayer can hold you into, that God and humanity uh, and God and yourself are held in one in Christ as nowhere else and that he is drawing towards that, us towards that pervasion of the world with the Spirit and with Christ. That is the goal, the risen future, as it were, which is so com I so much sense in um, uh, Orthodox worship, just as I sensed it in that saying of the prayer in the chapel, that sense of a new creation lying ahead towards which we are moving. That is our destiny. And that's the way the Triads book ended up. Indeed, the earlier man, Father Makarios, uh, was brutally treated, very cruelly treated by the Orthodox Church because he didn't take the right line on, on Cal the Chalcedon uh, attitude. He, 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 he stuck out for two wills being united in Christ, not just one will. 
Uh, it's too complicated to go into now, but, but that particular one will was people were rather hot on at the time, thought it would make things simpler. And therefore, they were so angry with him that he was tortured until he died. His tongue was taken out and his hand cut just because they had defended the wrong thing. Extraordinary that people could do that. So you can see there are very great dangers in dogmatism of any sort. But actually what was being opposed to them was not another dogmatism, but a holding to a deep, rich, strong sense that the union of God and humanity is one, which Makarios wrote so brilliantly about that his books are now being read a lot and very much in demand. And he himself apparently bore his end bravely and with great consciousness of God's love holding him even then. So that was an interesting sideline that just came through some of what we heard in Mount Athos. But what I particularly loved about um, the teaching that these people gave us is this very strong sense on the prayer flowing through you and drawing you in love into a future. The prayer is love. The prayer as you pray it is the grace and love of God flowing through you and drawing you into your own destiny. That's something we hadn't either of us quite known before. It was lovely. I came out of my room in one of the big, big the biggest monastery I mentioned and looked at a portrait on the wall that seemed strangely familiar. A white-haired man with a beard and lovely whiskers, as it were, looking down at me and with a shrewd twinkle in his eye. I suddenly rose and a voice behind me said, That's, that is Father uh, Sophroni, he said, Archimandrite Sophroni. He said he, he uh, was a monk in one of the monasteries here and we all knew him. He's the place in Essex, you know, he said. <laughs> Wasn't that a lovely connection? <laughs> and then, of course, the loveliest thing of all was that the monastery, one brilliant and inspired teacher of, of um, uh, uh, spirituality, uh, had been asked to go to a monastery that was dying. It just had a few dear old chaps in it, but it was falling to bits, as it were. And he himself, who had already founded a convent, not, of course, quite in Mount Athos, but not far away, in, in something that belonged to one of the Mount Athos monasteries. He'd founded a convent which was as big as the monastery that he'd also founded, and he inspired people tremendously. He, he was asked, his name was Emilios, he was asked to go and take over one of the monasteries in Mount Athos itself, which was failing and ailing, and he had taken it over. Strangely, he himself, after he'd been a brilliant leader of it and inspired the whole new community, got a, an illness which gradually silenced him, and, and although he was a marvellous inspired speaker, and, and he died eventually, not able to speak. But he kept his whole sense of joy and love, and they printed all the addresses he'd given, and they put the book by his bed. And he was so thrilled with that. And also they said that a scent rose from the book. It would happen in Mount Athos, of course. <laughs> uh, rose from the book and they, they sensed it. So, but he had inspired this and his, one of the monks who came with him is now the abbot, Elysius. So you can imagine that monastery was the highlight. It's on the top of a rock of, uh, a pillar of rock, rises out of the sea and has a stone place by it. You can you get across it. You get across to it on, on a road that just goes up to it. And it's so beautiful. And the monks there, you could feel it much more than anywhere in the chapel. The way they sang the offices, sometimes it sounded like a bit of a gabble in some of the monasteries where people were trying to get through an immense amount of verbiage. But, but here, it was as they sang it, they sang with delight and they had beautiful voices. The spirit seemed to give them that as well. And they were a wonderful community. And Elysius, the present head monk, uh, had been trained and been the right-hand person of the dear old Emilius who had come and restarted it. There was a wonderful feeling of God there. And I could suddenly sense, they told me something very, very important. They said, the Jesus' prayer is always the realization of your baptism. It is your baptism coming right through to you. In your baptism, 
you were united with Christ and made one with him. You were cleansed by the waters. You went through the death and resurrection of Christ with him. And that stays in you and with you, uh, working in the spirit as and when it can. But when the Jesus prayer begins, they said, the baptism takes hold of you more and more and you reunite with your baptism, very sacramental. <coughs> and in another characteristic about their worship, their Eucharistic worship, one sensed at once that the same thing was true, that they were united, not only in the saying of the prayer together and praying it, but united as a body in this very <coughs> strong sense of the Spirit holding them to the Eucharist. And somehow both these things came into the prayer. It was, prayer is expression of the sacraments. So I thought that was a very significant, fresh insight for me, and from found in such a place where you could feel it all around you, which was lovely. In all the monasteries, you could feel something of this <coughs> in some of the people. And there were some lovely people who spoke to us, but I think this particular monastery was the one that uh, stood out. I've got a book just lying on the <coughs> table here, which has a picture of the monastery on the front. And I thought some people might like to look at it. I'm sorry I haven't got more than one copy, but it's printed in some obscure place over in Greece, and I haven't fixed it up yet, not picked it up yet where it is. But they had th this book, which is the, the addresses of the man who, who refounded it. So you can imagine what a fresh inspiration this has been. I would say the visit to Mount Athos has been putting the whole thing into a new motion, as it were, for us, and literally into motion, and drawing us deeper and more richly into the prayer. And even someone like myself, who has had all these problems and probably has quite a lot of them still, can really be helped by this prayer wonderfully. So I'm certain that everyone here can be very much more. Thank you. Thank you. Got some questions. I'm going to ask one question, um, which is that you say it's important to be taught the prayer. Yes. Um, can we, who, who don't benefit from Father Savoni <laughs> and the three weekly visits, can we just um, read your book and, and go for it? Of course, absolutely, Fantastic. heavens. Fantastic. Um, I, I certainly went for it. <coughs> uh, 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 others have gone for it too. Mm. But if you do find someone, happen to find somebody who prays the prayer, and there are quite a few Anglicans who are quite into it, as it were, it would be lovely uh, to get that person to, to pray with you. And indeed, if you have a spiritual guide or helper, or you're thinking of having one, a very good idea, and even if they haven't, they'll be able to, to, to ask you about how you're getting on with the prayer and encourage and help you, I'm quite sure. It doesn't have to be, a, in inverted commas, expert at all. <laughs> I certainly am, am not, but I do teach a lot of people too. Oh, that's a bit hard on the English churches, I think. But that prayer does bring in a, a, a something with it. That's perfectly true. If, if you find that there, of course, if it's being corporately prayed in that way, certainly we find something special. I, I have, I hope, conveyed that in those monasteries. But I think I find something special in any, every monastery, certainly in this country too that I visit, there's always something really encouraging and some lovely person who can tell you more and so on. Uh, so I think it's a characteristic of, of monasteries that are going well, as it were, and even when they aren't, sometimes they tell you, oh, it's a terrible time we're having here, and you feel um, a wonderful sense of the presence and love yourself. <laughs> it's quite a paradox, but that happens, and it's comforting to us, isn't it, that that could happen through us too for others. Uh, but certainly I, I do think there is a special quality in the Orthodox monasteries, but I wouldn't want to confine it to them. I'm sure they wouldn't want to. I think there are plenty of monasteries and communities here and in other parts of Europe, for that matter, which have got a great deal to offer us. But certainly I have to say that the Jesus Prayer uh, has been a very rich help to many, many people 
and has got so much of the quality and character of something that's been given by the Spirit to the church as a whole through the Orthodox that I think to go a visit to the, a monastery like that is a particular blessing. I can't deny that. Yes, um, it, it, seemed, it seems, of course, quite varied, and I think um, uh, they themselves were standing all the time, so often, because that is their whole custom. I don't stand myself, I just sit uh, in the way that I'm accustomed to doing. Some people, of course, do like to have a prayer stool, and uh, I find that quite helpful to have a, a little stool that you sit on and so on, just to get yourself into a kind of at your disposal kind of approach um, <laughs> yourself at God's disposal. But I don't think uh, it's essential in any way. Um, I'm sure that um, uh, the standing is very much part of their whole tradition and therefore they'd be more likely to do that and find that easy than we might. Uh, I think for, for ourselves, sitting is fine and I noticed that one or two of them sat to pray the prayer uh, themselves too. So I, I'm sure that sitting is perfectly all right. Of course you will be with your feet firmly on the ground, you will be upright, you, you will have your hands open in some way to God and be, be reaching out and, and be still. But I wouldn't go further than that. Because one can also see that walking in time with your steps. Absolutely. How grateful I am to you for saying that. I should have said it early on and I forgot. You can walk a long way. That I, that's what came to me quite early on, really, from the first learning of it, um, and encouraged in me by, the, uh, the, uh, by Father Sofroni uh, to walk, and the prayer going with your walking. I've even found it going with my cycling. <laughs> <laughs> but walking's best. One more. Yeah. Uh, and of course, in time of the breath, you mentioned this on, on page 50 of the old edition. Yes. You mentioned here, you can say we're breathing in in the first part, breathing out in the second part. Yes. I've always assumed and practiced exactly the other way round. I'm breathing sure out. that doesn't matter at all. That's no, probably no, no, just no, well, as good. Well, there's, there's some sort of logic in breathing out, Lord Jesus Christ, and breathing out. And then yes. Breathing in the no, I only the mentioned place. it that way because that was how. Um, one, an orthodox uh, yes. uh, friend uh, of uh, somebody at the community of yes. Father Sofoni taught me that he did it and so I tried it and I really found it was too complicated for me and I didn't <laughs> go on with it. Um, but they obviously, quite a lot of people do breathe the prayer in that way and I'm sure whether you do it as he did, tell, told me to do, which must give it some sort of orthodox authority, um, do it breathing in, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, I can't do it speaking it now like that. So perhaps you ha it's quite difficult to do. And breathing out, uh, it doesn't matter. Yes, exactly what you were going to say. I was going to say I think it's far more important that something comes easily, as it were. And I think um, I gave up the, one or two things like that that I tried for a bit, like the breathing, and just found saying the prayer. And Father Sofroni encouraged me in that. He was very relaxed about the, the whole thing and um, uh, didn't feel that one had to have some particular posture or way of doing it exactly. Uh, so that was, but certainly I'm pretty sure he would very much have approved of the walking <coughs> uh, idea too. Uh, I'm sure that on the whole they, they do seem to me more relaxed than lots of people about how things are done like that. Oh, I should have mentioned that right at the beginning, because like you, I met it, I read it years before and found it very moving. And it's got a lot of good points in it, I think. It's a lovely book about a man, a man in the 19th century in Russia who is 
I don't think he can quite be a peasant family, actually, but he's, he's very indeterminate exactly what he is. His father seems to have had some uh, trade or, or place in things, but he set out from that and just wandered around Russia looking for the answer for what he'd heard in the lesson read, uh, pray without ceasing. How could you do that? And he asks innumerable people, and they give him long lectures about prayer, but he doesn't get very far from them or with them. And eventually he got, gets to quite a grumpy old monk walking along the road. And he said, can you tell me how? Yes, I can if you come with me to your cell. I'm not going to talk to you about it here. He says, come with me to my cell. And he takes him back to his cell. And there he makes him get a job as a gardener locally, I think, uh, to, to, to keep himself going. Uh, and while he's doing that, he's got to say the prayer thousands of times. He's, he, I, how he counts the times, I can't think. It's quite difficult to... I must admit that I did find... Um, uh, where did I put that prayer rope? Yes, I did find uh, that somebody said to me at a meeting of Orthodox and Anglicans and people in, the Orthodox Ang in Oxford, um, Orthodox monks said, Don't, we won't do it, you lead the prayer, he said. And I thought, heavens. He said, give them a hundred. And I thought, well, how will I be able to count a hundred? I was quite taken aback. And then I suddenly realized, of course, there are a hundred knots in my rope. So I was all right. <laughs> I could just pray the prayer. It was a group of Anglicans and um, Callistos Ware and all sorts of wonderful people were there. So I did have to get it right. But thank God, it seemed to pass away, pass through, I won't say pass away pass through very ha happily. Um, so yes, uh, some people obviously have set store by, uh, like as in the way of a pilgrim, by ha having numbers of times. I think that was very typical of the pilgrim in a way. Much the loveliest thing in the book that happened, and it was a delightful book, let me hasten to add, and all the people he met and his joy in meeting them, and then the person who took his special book that he'd managed to buy about it, the Philokalia, which is the kind of list of all sorts of things that the fathers have written about this prayer right through. It's a lovely book. It's now been translated into English, and you can get it in paperback, um, three volumes of it. I hope a fourth is coming out soon. Um, and that, that uh, all happened for him. But the, the, one of the loveliest things of all was when he said, in the time when he was spending being a gardener with that man, one morning, the prayer woke me. I've always remembered that. It had gone into his heart, and it was now praying the pr itself within him. And that's given me a chance just to mention something that I might not have mentioned otherwise, that you could find and can find, but don't worry about it, that um, if you keep praying the prayer, the prayer will just suddenly start within you, which is lovely through the Spirit. But that's a delightful book. It's called The Way of a Pilgrim. I think it's in paperback, still available. And as, lo one, as long as one doesn't take everything, it says too much to heart, as it were. It's a delightful uh, <coughs> piece of writing. And it started being printed in England in the late end of the 20s, translated and printed, and has gone on ever since. The Way of a Pilgrim. I don't think it doesn't tell us who he is, or more than that. Um, I'm going to, and unless there's anybody else, I think I'm going to hog the last question to myself. Um, <clears throat> in the book, you say that uh, people, I am one of these people, think, um, think of prayer as being on a faulty line, telephone line to God. Um, and that when you realised it was more the stepping into continuous prayer, like into a river, that that was um, a great change. Now, I don't really understand that. Can you say something more about that? I think I, it was a liberation for me, and the thing is that things which were a liberation for oneself aren't always for others necessarily, and I have to remember that. But I think it's a liberation for me to realize that prayer was stepping into the stream of the spirit that is flowing, and that stream I see as the flow of love between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. It's a flow of love. In fact, it's very close to what the monk said to me when he said the Jesus prayer is love flowing, as it were. 
it's that sense that there is a, a stream flowing and into which one is coming, the stream of the spirit, not something that one's got to start from scratch and make work, if you see what I mean. I wouldn't want to be too precise or literal about it because it's a very vague, attra attractively vague metaphor, but it's the idea of, of, pra of prayer and sometimes I think thoughts of God and everything if one's just coming into a stream that's flowing and you, you go with it. And I, th I wouldn't want to make it more than a, an attractive metaphor. <laughs> it is one. Mm -hmm. <coughs> well, thank you, Bishop. Thank mm -hmm. you so much for teaching us. Thank that. you.